it's obvious that this person had some premeditated uh, aspirations. I got nightmares in my head. I fear thoughts build up until I can't feel. My mind fills up into a creature, and it haunts me somewhere much deeper. I got nightmares in my head. I fear the thoughts build up until I can't hear. That my mind fills up into a creature, and it haunts me somewhere much deeper. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Charlotte Cena's grandfather Patrick was awarded $2.2 million in 1998. You might say, 1998, that's 25 years ago. How's that relevant? Well, it is. Patrick had sued the small town of Greenfield over a sledding accident and that whole lawsuit played out over several years and ended up in the local newspapers. And so just a little bit more detail. So the sledding accident involved Charlotte's father, David. He was seven years old at the time. David, this little boy, suffered a broken pelvis and spine fracture, pretty serious uh, injuries. And then Patrick Cena died about 17 years later. And so guess who was the beneficiary? Well, Charlotte's father, David. Now a former girlfriend of Ross Jr., Amanda Priest, thinks the father of three, right, Ross Jr., wanted the $50,000 firstly because he knew about the Cena's backstory, which, as you can imagine, was all over the local news, but also because of his own mounting financial malaise. He was in serious financial doo-doo. Now, thus far, this channel has tried to let the evidence lead us in this case rather than wave red flags and try to shock and sensationalize this case with a sexual narrative. There may, be, there may be a sexual narrative, but it appears to be irrelevant to this case, this case involving Charlotte Cena. And who better to comment on the real Ross Jr. than his former partner? Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Bear in mind I'm going to be dealing with a story that has been in the news for a little while, dealing with Gabby Petito. I'll be dealing with that in an episode following this one. The Gabby Petito story is quite personal to me, and I mean, I spent two months traveling in America earlier this year, retracing her footsteps in a, in a way, and so I... Um, I sort of feel like there's a little bit of unfinished business in terms of that particular case. So it should be quite a poignant and important episode. If you're finding this analysis worthwhile, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So have a look at this story in the local news. Town settles with manhood sledding. And even if you don't read that whole story, it is about a accident that happened in the story, it says, nearly 10 years ago. And so you can see how long this whole lawsuit was dragging on in the local media. And obviously, the longer it is dragging on, the more people would have been aware of it. And just look at the dollar amounts that are mentioned in this article, 3.7 million, 2.2 million, $1 $1 million, $242,000, and so on and so on. Now, incidentally, this is the mailbox where Ross Jr. made his fateful mail run under the cover of darkness. He uh, put the letter into this mailbox, I think, at 4.20 a.m. I don't know whether he drove by and while still in the vehicle popped the letter in, but that's how I imagine it. I don't think he drove there, stopped, got out. I think he drove there, stopped, and just quickly put the letter in and drove off and kind of wrong-footed the cops. Now, apparently the demand for $50,000 was written by Charlotte, quite clever, and I guess a mailman might think of something like that. Now, there were some of you who thought they didn't think it was premeditated and you can just ask this little girl for the address. Well, if you have serious financial problems, well, then you're going to need to get serious cash. And so you're going to need to know that the people you are trying to get cash from, have the money. And so without knowing that, you might be wasting your time. You might be doing something and the people are going to say, sorry, I don't have any money, Um, right? And so how can someone who wants to commit a crime like this 
get a kind of a guarantee, well, through the media narrative, that's one way. Now, we're going to deal with the financial narrative in this episode, and I'm sorry, it's going to be just boring old facts. It does happen to be a fact that one of the idiosyncrasies of this case is the demand for a ransom. The, the, one of the central things that uh, differentiates this case from many others is that it's about a demand for money. Basically, if you give me money, I will give you back your daughter. And so this letter, depositing it in the mailbox, is how and why Ross Jr. got himself caught in this process of trying to transact, right? But I guess if you if you want the motive to be worse than that, like if you feel like, well, money is kind of boring, I'd like a motive that's a lot more shocking. Um, you know, if you want Ross Jr. to be more of a monster than he really was, I mean, to Charlotte Cena, well, then you can. It's just not material to this case or this victim. But if you if you want him to be this this monster that, that you'd like him to be. Um, unfortunately, on this channel, we, we deal with boring facts, you know, as if this is a boring courtroom listening to evidence, you know, let's say in a murder trial or some other serious crime. Uh, the, the good news is if you'd like the sexier, more shocking, scarier, entertaining story involving a little girl, um, you know, what could have happened to a little girl but actually didn't, well, then I think you know where to go. But what we're going to deal with on this channel in this episode is money troubles. So if you would rather not hear those facts, then now is your time to to um, head out and don't let the door hit you on the way out either. Right, money troubles. So for those who are here, let's put on our thinking caps and deal with the substantive facts of this case. So uh, Ross Jr. was, as we thought, um, in financial difficulty, he was reportedly behind on tax payments for a property in Porter's Corner. That's the property that he owned less than two miles from Charlotte's parents' home. So there's also confirmation that he was attached to that property and he was connected in, in terms of debt to that property. And so he was forced to move back in with his mother four weeks before uh, the uh, incident took place. Right, this incident at the at the park where this little girl was snatched, and so why did he move back? Because of his financial troubles, because of money troubles. The other thing that I think is interesting is he has to leave his home and go and live in not particularly nice circumstances. And guess who lives in that same sort of area? Because they are pretty well off. Well, surely just to the course of every day. Um, you know, movements, driving around, going to the convenience store, surely he drove quite close to that property. Surely in a small town like that, people spoke about that property and the people who lived there. Anyway, I saw another channel emphasizing something else Ross Jr. did over the past month. I'm not sure if he was forced to move back into a trailer. Think, it, put, put, put yourself in his shoes. If you were forced to leave your home and you couldn't make tax payments on your home, and you had to go and live in a trailer, you had to move back with your parents, wouldn't that be a, a serious factor that, that would be troubling you, that you, you're losing your own home? Sorry, I know it's boring, but, but isn't this what was really driving him, that he didn't want to be living in that trailer, he didn't want to be having this financial difficulty, and he was trying to figure some way out of it, you know, he was basically losing his home and facing a serious financial crisis, but he didn't know how to get out of it. He didn't know of an honest way to get out of it. He was basically in a money emergency, and that can make people do desperate things. And so this is where the light of illumination kind of gives us some insight here. As we know, Charlotte's grandfather sued the town of Greenfield years ago and Priest said, you know, the people around Saratoga knew this. It was, it, was, it was common knowledge. And so he says, I think that's why he held her ransom. He was hoping to get some of the money because he's struggling financially. That kind of money would set him up for around four or five years. So he has someone close to him that is figuring out likely why what happened happened. Do you agree with what she's saying? I think it's quite strange that his own girlfriend seems to emphasize this as a motive and not something else. 
So do, do you think she's trying to entertain the newspapers with her story, or do, do you think she's simply saying things that she knows, uh, how, you know, things that she knows and things that she understands? Do you think she's trying to be popular to the reporters that she's talking to? She goes on to say, and this is really interesting, she says, he's never wanted to work. He's always wanted to find people to mooch off, whether it be girlfriends or making his mother feel bad because his multiple sclerosis is so bad. And so there you have it. His multiple sclerosis is apparently a real factor and maybe either why he didn't want to work or perhaps why he couldn't work. But the bottom line is, it looks like he was unemployed at the time and in a financial hole. Now, again, you can say, I don't want to talk about the multiple sclerosis. I mean, his girlfriend is. His girlfriend was saying it's an important factor. But let's rather talk about something else. Maybe that was driving him. But that's not what she's saying. Ross moved into the squalid RV trailer behind his mother's home, according to the article in the Daily Mail, because the, his condition was also getting worse. In other words, his health is declining at the same time that his finances are worse, worsening. And so whatever you, you know, if you're looking at him and you see whatever you see, I'm sure you've got a label that's already well worked out. You've got some sort of name for, for, for him. But, you know, if you think of it just in a basic way, he is finding that he doesn't have really any choice. And obviously he does. But the important thing is he's not feeling as if he can find a workable solution to his deteriorating situation. And so he's getting desperate. He's getting desperate because of declining health and he's getting desperate because of his finances. And I think if you want to fixate on the sexual narrative, you're just not going to see that. You're not also going to say, yeah, but that's not really interesting. Now, the part that is, for me, really interesting with this is the criminal psychology. His, his, his girlfriend says that, well, his ex-girlfriend said that he thinks that he, he moved to this trailer, this RV trailer, that that was a ruse to set him up in a place where he could do what he, 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 was, he had designs on doing. So he, he did have, she calls it a ruse, um, that he'd, he had the strategy to keep um, the schoolgirl after he'd snatched her and he'd put tops over the windows to block them and all of that was to ensure privacy. And all of this happened, that putting the tarp in place happened long before he actually snatched Charlotte. And can you see again, she, she's not suggesting that Ross moved there for any sexual reasons, but for strategic reasons, so that he had a private place to keep someone prisoner, so that he could execute this crime that he wanted to do the way he wanted to do it. She's also clearly suggesting this was a premeditated crime, and that he specifically targeted a particular family, a family of means. And so, again, if you refuse to consider Ross Jr.'s personal circumstances, well, then you're not going to see how obvious the pre premeditation aspect is here. According to his ex, he had been following her family. He knew where they lived. He, he watched her until they went around one last time and he scooped her up. She says, I feel he definitely had this pre-planned. He put a top of the windows a few months prior. Oh, that's actually quite interesting. A few months prior. So I feel like he had been planning it for a while. You know, and it's possible that he kind of planned it and he was hoping that there would be an opportunity and maybe there wasn't an opportunity and maybe his health improved for a period and maybe his finances, there's a bit of a light on the horizon for a while and then eventually there wasn't. In any event, she says he's patient that way for messed up things like that. And so... She goes on to say, the man didn't work. So in all that time, he's sitting there drinking like his mother. Uh, he's thinking about his next moves. He's plotting. He's planning. His mother could have seen through the window from a patio. So that's why he put up the top, according to his ex. She says, you don't just take a child out of nowhere. He waited until she did one final loop on her own. And I think he was watching her for a while. From his his ex, we also get a fascinating insight into how Ross Jr. likely may have encountered the scene as directly. 
It started indirectly, as we know, by reading about their story in the paper and perhaps thinking, wow, I actually live just around the corner from them and learning about their financial bonanza. But her theory, her theory on how he may have encountered the little girl directly also makes complete sense because she says that Ross could have met Charlotte while taking his own daughter, who was 11 years old, just two years older, to softball games in the area. And he could have sort of, that's plausible deniability for watching the two girls playing on the same fields. And uh, the other thing that's interesting is he also previously went to um, Moreau uh, Lake State Park. And what did he do there? He went swimming and biking with his family. He took his own chore and camping there. And he must have realized this is a, you know, a um, not only did he have local knowledge, and I've said that before, but um, he had the, um, the knowledge of seeing his own children in this particular terrain. The last thing she says is to go to the campsite where they were at, to know where they lived and to go to the park when they were, were there. He definitely had this planned. He's the type of person where he pre-plans and it can be months ahead to do something. She also says, I think other people should know that he potentially met Charlotte while she was playing at the same field as his daughter. You never know who he might have come in contact with. And that basically gives us, I think, a really interesting insight into this particular perpetrator's potential criminal psychology. I'm not going to take it further than that, but as I say, please look out for the analysis on the Gabby Petito story. Uh, It should be... um, It certainly made me think and feel when I put it together. So look out for that. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.